everybody and welcome to today's presentation on the economic significance of the Frida Fort impact structure. And before I ask Nolene to introduce Dr. Huber, just a, a few reminders, please keep your microphones off, keep your um, videos off. It helps those with limited bandwidth. And I would like to remind everyone of our sponsor, TerraCore Geospectral Imaging, who is the sponsor for the entire month of July. And we'd like to say thank you very much to them. Nolene, if you would um, introduce our speaker, please. You sure? Yes, please. <laughs> Dr. Matthew Hoover is a senior lecturer at the University of the Free State. He has five years experience in teaching at university level and is committed to helping university students develop their full potential in their studies. He also partners with university programs and outreach events that help promote learning and support the community. Prior to his current position, he did postdoctoral work at the University of the Free State and Freie Universiteit Brussels in Belgium. Matthew got his BSc at the University of Tennessee at Martin, his Masters of Science in Geology at Louisiana State University and his doctorate at the University of Vienna. There's much more about Matthew and his work and publications on the GSS calendar, if you'd like to go and have a look. And with that, I'll hand over to Matthew. Okay. Let's see if I can get this going on here. Okay. Uh, hello everyone, greetings from Bloemfontein. Thank you for the introduction. Um, can I please just uh, confirm one last time that everyone can hear me and see the screen? Yes, Matthew, we can all hear you and see the, the slides. Thank you. Wonderful. So you've all joined today to hear about the economic significance of the Fredaport Impact Event. Now, there are quite a number of impact structures on Earth. Uh, right now, the count is right about 200 different impact structures that are known all over the world. And these tend to be concentrated at places where there are old rocks and places where there are a lot of geologists to go and look at those rocks. Of all the craters that are known, the largest three are the Sudbury Impact Crater in Canada, the Chicxulub Impact Structure in Mexico, and the Fredford Impact Structure in South Africa generally considered the largest impact structure on Earth. So we're familiar with the Capfall Craton. The Fredaport structure is almost a bullseye in the middle of the Capfall Craton, and of course is situated right in the middle of the Witwatersrand gold deposits. We'll talk more about that later. Now, I do want to talk a little bit before we get going about the distinction between the Fredaport impact structure, the Fredaport dome and the Vredefort event. The Vredefort structure covers a much larger area than what's usually thought of as the Vredefort dome. So there's also the Potterstrom synclinorium, which you can see, uh, this is a digital elevation model. In the right, in the middle of the image, you can see the uh, uplifted hills that make the collar of the Vredefort structure. But going around that, you can see that there's other concentric structures that that wrap around. When we trace these out, this is what gives us the estimation that the original size of the structure probably was close to about 300 kilometers. The central part of that is what's usually referred to as the Vredefort Dome, which is a structural uplift. And that's where the majority of the studies that are specific to Vredefort have taken place. Now, based on the work that's been done, we know that the age of the Vredefort event was almost precisely 2020 million years ago. And the, the Redport Dome gets divided into the crystalline core of the structure that's mainly made up of um, granites, granitoids, and other crystalline rocks, and the uplifted collar rocks that are made of metasedimentary and metavolcanic rocks. Since the time that the Redport structure formed, there's been close to 10 kilometers of erosion or an estimated 10 kilometers, which gives us the current topographic profile. This is unique among impact structures on Earth because most of the impact structures 
are not so deeply eroded, or when they do become deeply eroded, they become unrecognizable. Rutifort is an enormous structure, and we get to see the deep architecture of it, which makes it a wonderful place for study. Now, the, the Rutifort impact event is what we refer to as the time when the actual structure formed. And this can be numerically modeled. So what we know about the Vredefort impact event is that uh, the Vredefort structure was probably formed by the collision of a circa 14 kilometer diameter object from outer space that crashed into crystalline uh, rocks that were the foundation, which were overlain by these supercrustal strata. So in this model, this uh, half circle, this is going to be in half space. This half circle at the top represents the impactor, the gray represents the sediments, and the pink represents the uh, granite, granitic basement. This blue box that's in the top right of this image is the same as the blue box that's in the middle of it. So we can see what happens during the impact process. Oh, maybe. So this is a massive event that forms this uh, Rutherford structure. So the first thing that happens is we have the contact and compression stage when the crust is down warped by about 30 kilometers. At the same time, you can see that this transient cavity is opening. The supercrustal rocks on top are being uh, ejected outwards and at this point are uplifted to essentially vertical and will then be overturned. Now after the transient cavity reaches its maximum, then the cavity collapses, rebound begins to occur until eventually after a little bit of time we get um, overturned supercrustal strata. This corresponds to uh, what we know is the collar rocks of the Grutterfort Dome. And at its peak, the, the central uplift in the middle goes up about 15 kilometers above the surface, the pre-impact surface. Okay. Trying to move on to the next slide, just a moment. So what we see in terms of the development of the impact is that there's quite a few stages. We have the contact and compression stage, the excavation of the transient cavity, and then eventually the overturn that's left behind. Now, in the process of doing this, the strata that are deeply buried pre-impact are brought up towards the surface. The other thing that we see in red in this diagram is that you have melting of the rocks. This is an enormous deposition of energy that takes place. So this can melt significant volumes of rock and eventually form a melt sheet that can be, uh, in the case of Redford sized events, multiple kilometers thick. Now, after those events happen, all of that happens in the space of less than 10 minutes but the actual formation of the entire impact structure can last for over 100,000 years because after the impact has occurred, then there is an immediate loss of mass from the point of impact. And then there is crustal re-equilibration that takes place after the uh, mass is removed. So as there is uh, the movement of crustal material back in to try to re-equilibrate the mass balance, there's massive faults that are formed that greatly expand the total size of the impact structure. So that um, if you looked at the diameter on the model, it's, it's well explaining the Vredefort dome, but it doesn't explain how we get to 300 kilometers. That diameter would have been achieved after the time of impact. If we compare this to structures that are on the moon, uh, I have here an image of the Schrodinger crater on the south pole of the moon that is also about 300 kilometers in diameter. You can see that it's mostly, uh, the surface is mostly flat. That is molten material that was melted by the impact uh, for the most part. There's also mare basalts on the moon. 
Um, but then you also see that there's this ring structure, this peak ring in the middle, and that corresponds pretty closely to what we see at Redifort. So that when we have a cross section of this, the diameters of things would be different on Earth compared to the moon. Um, but we have uh, significant fracturing, uh, very thick melt sheet, and then these uplifted rocks in both the center of the structure and at some distance from the center of the structure. So in terms of what's happening during the impact, when you deposit this energy, immediately you're vaporizing the rocks at the point of contact, melting rocks for some diameter outside of that, shock metamorphosing rocks outside of that zone, and then brecciation and structural deformation can occur in quite a distance around that. This means that during the impact, you are producing products that are impossible to produce other ones. So in this diagram, you can see the shaded gray zone is essentially every process that we have measure of on Earth, give or take, so that at the highest pressures that we can really see rocks forming on Earth, we're getting pressures significant enough to form diamond. During the impact process, we're getting much higher shock pressures. So this allows for uh, a lot of different uh, types of products to form. So in addition to the brecciation, we're forming impact melt, we're forming high pressure polymorphs, and we are shock deforming the minerals that are present. So in terms of, of what we can see as a result of this, uh, the only uh, what's considered definitive evidence that you're looking at an impact crater that you can see with the naked eye are shatter cones. These look pretty similar to blasting cones and these form when you have the shock wave passing very rapidly and expanding around some uh, point of weakness that, um, that allows this fracture pattern that's very characteristic to form. In terms of rocks that are melted, we have two major melts that we observe in these large impact craters. Now in Redifort, and Sudbury, we see the same things. Um, one is the pseudotacolites. These are rocks that were melted in place. And then at Redifort, the other type of melt we refer to as the Redifort granifier. This is rock that was melted at the surface and then brought down. So some of you may have seen the Loikop quarry before. This was mined for granite uh, for many years until that was stopped, I think, in the 1970s. And you can see this black rock that's cutting through this quarry this black material is the impact melt, but this was melted in place. So if you measure the composition of this, it is essentially granitic. We find these pseudotacolites in all the different rock types, and what we mostly find is that in almost every place, the composition of the melt mirrors the composition of the host. By contrast, we have the granifier dikes. This is material that has a very unusual composition that pretty closely equates to bulk crustal composition when we measure it at Redifort. Um, we could compare this to the melt sheet at Sudbury, where also the bulk melt sheet at Sudbury is considered bulk continental crust, because you have an impact event that is large enough to penetrate through the entire crust, melt that material, and then homogenize it. From that homogenized crustal material, we are deriving these dikes. Now, uh, within the dikes, we find a lot of little clasps, and you can see the little bumps on the top of that image on that pavement uh, at the top, and those little uh, clasps are derived from all sorts of different lithologies. So it appears that those are xenoliths that were transported down with the molten material. Now, we have gone there with geophysical equipment and measured the, uh, the resistivity signature of the rocks. And so these resistivity images at the bottom, all the greens and blues, this comparatively low resistivity material, that's the host crystalline rocks. The little red dot at the top of each of those images is the, the granifier material. So what we see in the core of the structure is that the geophysical signal disappears at less than five meters below the surface. So it seems like we may be at a, a little bit of a fortuitous time to be able to study these before they are completely erosionally removed. We see a lot um, of pavements. Uh, we see a few pavements. We see a, a lot of places where there's just isolated boulders, uh, as in this image on the top right, 
where it's uh, just the last remnant material of these dikes. But we see a lot of quench textures in them as well that indicate to us that these uh, were descended into the rocks and then fairly rapidly crystallized. Now, in addition to the melt formation, we also have phase transitions. So very commonly, uh, we see that there's phase transitions of quartz. So as we move through a pressure temperature diagram, uh, when the impact happens, you go from whatever your ambient conditions are to extremely high pressures, followed by extremely high temperatures in an extremely short period of time. Um, so you can immediately transition a mineral like quartz up into stishovite, and in some cases you can even completely melt the quartz crystals. What we do see is that there is an effect of shock localization, however, so that uh, the red pathway seems to indicate what's happening to quartz within pseudotacolite veins that we were measuring, whereas the blue line indicates what was happening in the host rocks. So the pseudotacolite veins where the melting is taking place seems to be a zone of shock localization, where the shock pressures are much higher. And we can also see this in terms of shock deformation. So uh, these are images of zircon crystals from electron backscatter diffraction. We found a sample where there were pre-impact uh, tectonically generated melt veins, pseudotacolites, and then impact generated pseudotacolites. And we looked at zircons in each one of them. So the critical thing with this is actually looking at the scale bars on each of these images. In the host rock, you can see that uh, the electron backscatter diffraction indicates that this mineral was deformed to a maximum of about five degrees. And you can see some little linear features in there. Those would be related to the shock. Those are planar deformation uh, features that are forming in, in these zircons. In the middle image, there's a band that goes up to 25 degrees bending. And this looks like this is what's happening in the tectonic setting. But on the image on the right, you can see that the scale bar goes up to 90 degrees. This is a zircon crystal that was bent in half by the impact process. And that's what's happening within the pseudotacolite vein. So these are the essential, um, the, in a very basic and quick form, those are the kinds of products that can be forming when the impact occurs. Um, but then we want to know, the title of this talk is the economic significance of the Rutherford impact event. And so we want to look at these types of processes in economic terms. Now, um, Sudbury is one of the, the major places that we'll look, and this is the big nickel in Sudbury, Canada, which is uh, the site where a huge amount of nickel has been mined out of an impact crater. So um, before I start talking about the economic processes that are going on or how these shock processes relate to economic uh, processes, I want to talk a little bit about the meteorite itself because I've very often had people ask me, where is the meteorite of Rutherford? Um, the, the meteorite is gone. It completely vaporizes at the moment of impact. So uh, we have here an image of Meteor Crater in Arizona in the United States. This is the Behringer Meteor Crater because there was a gentleman named Behringer in the 1920s who purchased this property with the idea that since it's a meteorite impact from an iron meteorite, he should be able to drill in the middle of the crater and find the meteorite. And he spent the rest of his life drilling all over this crater looking for the meteorite. Um, it turns out it's the meteorite is scattered all around the impact crater. So we can see a map of all the locations where the meteorite was actually found it gets completely annihilated during the impact process. This is a tiny impact crater, especially compared to Rutherford. The Rutherford impactor would have been completely vaporized at the moment of impact. Now, I showed you a moment ago, phase transitions in shock metamorphism in quartz and zircon. These are not economically significant, but what happens if the impact occurs into a coal deposit? Well, exactly that has happened at a couple of locations in Russia. So there is the Papagai impact crater and the Kara impact craters in Russia that both had as part of their target rocks significant coal deposits. And so 
when you put coal under extremely high pressure, what you get is diamond. So you can see uh, images A through D uh, in this diagram. These are impact produced diamonds. It turns out that there's entire horizons in the Kara impact crater in particular that have recently been shown to be loaded with shock diamonds. There's also other polymorphs of the of, of carbon. So there's graphite and carbon glass that get formed there. Um, but there are a significant number of impact diamonds that can form as, as a potentially economic process. This is not being mined at this time. Now, could such things form at Vredefort? Um, it requires that you have a load of carbon on the surface to be, to be shock metamorphosed into impact diamonds. At this time, we do not have any evidence that that was present at the site of Redefort. However, what we do know is that the Redefort material was ejected to Karelia, Russia. And we know about this because of a drilling project that was actually looking at shungites. And a shungite is fossilized oil, more or less. So in, in these images, you can see the little black spots in these thin section images. And those black spots are, are remnants of carbon. So there were, um, there were hydrocarbon deposits on Earth at the time of the Vredefort impact. We don't know of any that were present at the at the site of the Bredeport impact. If these did form, then uh, they presumably eroded away by now. Now, the next thing we can look at are melt sheets and melt dikes. So as I already mentioned, the Sudbury impact uh, structure is uh, better known as the Sudbury mines. This is uh, one of the largest nickel copper PG deposits in the world. Uh, it's usually studied as a large igneous province by itself without, um, for many years, people didn't worry about how it formed. It just is a large igneous province. Uh, so we have indicated on the map here, all the dots indicate uh, mines that have been uh, exploring or working in either the basal parts of the melt sheet where these uh, sulfide, uh, sulfides that are rich in nickel, copper, and platinum group elements are concentrated, or in the offset dikes. Now, the offset dikes at Sudbury have been very clearly shown to be derived from the melt sheet and probably derived uh, at multiple time periods with a changing composition of the melt sheet. Um, but what's clearly been shown is that these host the nickel copper PG deposits to a great depth extent from the current surface level. Sudbury is a similar size impact structure to Rutterfort. And so we can. Uh, at a very basic level, expect that the same things that happened at Sudbury should have happened at Redefort. But Sudbury is tectonically preserved, and so we see a different erosional level of Sudbury than what we see at Redefort. Now, when we compare that to what we do see at Redefort, we have the granite fire dikes. And so one of the things we've been working on recently is trying to demonstrate whether or not we can demonstrate that the same types of processes that formed the offset dikes also formed the granifier dikes. Um, and I, I believe that they are essentially the same thing. What we're seeing at the granifier dikes is a little bit different than what we see at the offset dikes, though, because the granifier dikes appear to be the lowermost depth extent of these dike systems, or at the very least, um, what we're looking at is dikes that formed um, before sulfide saturation could be achieved in the melt sheet. So if we start with the impact event itself, um, in the top panel, we have the moments after the impact, and we are, we are showing how material is moved into the center of the structure. So we start with the, the impact and um, as the material, the crustal material begins to move upwards after the impact occurs, then the uh, basement rocks are fractured and uh, these fractures dilate and allow for molten material to intrude into the crust. As the melt sheet is differentiating, this process is ongoing at the same time so that the first 
dikes that penetrate into the crust after the impact are penetrating at higher temperatures and from a homogenized melt sheet, whereas the dikes that come down later are coming from a differentiated melt sheet. So probably what we're seeing at the, the offset dikes at Sudbury are these later intrusions that were at a little bit lower temperature after sulfide saturation and they could carry the PGEs. Whereas at Redifort, all we have preserved are the earliest dikes that um, intruded into the crust. So uh, again, if nickel copper PGE deposits existed at Redifort, uh, it seems like they've eroded away at this time. Now, the next thing that is potentially economically viable from impact craters is uh, hydrocarbons. Um, there's a lot of impact structures. This is an image of the Chicxulub uh, impact structure, which is deeply buried. Uh, it was discovered because of oil and gas exploration, and it's known to have some uh, oil and gas deposits below the structure. Uh, this uh, impact is most famous for killing the dinosaurs, but in general, hydrocarbons have accounted for about hydrocarbon deposits specifically associated with impact craters are known to account for about 15 billion US dollars per year in terms of material extracted. Now also associated with uh, these large impacts is a post-impact hydrothermal system. So when you deposit this massive amount of energy into the crust, you leave behind residual heat that lasts for quite a long time. So this has been shown uh, to exist after impacts on Earth and uh, Mars and the Moon, but also uh, at locations like the Soyan impact crater in Sweden, there are carbonates around the impact structure that were infiltrated by hot hydrothermal fluids and left behind lead zinc deposits that have been economically mined. So these Mississippi Valley type deposits can actually be driven by impact systems. Now, when we finally come to Bredefort and we look at what the target rocks were, um, the, the composition of the target rocks really determines a lot about what economic deposits can be preserved. And of course, the Bredefort structure is right in the middle of the Witwatersrand um, gold deposits. So, um, what we see here is a map that demonstrates the location of the Bredefort dome and the surrounding deformation effects that we see, including the uh, Potterstrom uh, synclinorium and the, the um, locations of the pseudotacolites that have been found both within the dome and in the gold fields. And we can see that these deformation effects do actually go out. The outer dashed line here indicates a 300 kilometer diameter. And so we can see that the Redefort structure as a whole includes all of the gold mining districts. So how is that possible and what was the actual effect of Redefort? Now we're familiar with the Witwatersrand gold deposits and we've, seen, we've all seen images like this where you have the, the gold that is making up the cross bedding core sets um, within these deposits. There's absolutely no doubt that this is a Plosser origin that these are deposits forming in a stream system, and that's where the gold comes from. Um, scans of samples of conglomerate, um, CT scan uh, in this case, pretty clearly shows that you're getting planar concentrations of gold, but there are other bits of gold in other parts of the samples. And there has been this longstanding question about what exactly was the effect of of the hydrothermal overprinting that is pervasive throughout the Vitz gold deposits. Now, at this time, I think the, uh, this model is presented by Hartwig Fremmel uh, in a paper last year is a pretty good explanation of the Vitz deposits in a primary sense. The primary gold was deposited by surface processes that were, um, the, the gold was dissolved within surficial waters and then microbially um, mediated and the gold was removed from solution. Um, but this may have just remained a buried anomaly had it not been for the Redford impact event. Uh, now, here what I'm showing is an image that's uh, part of the wonderful master's thesis of Marcello Malezzi that was produced in 2017. Um, and what you can see, uh, he was making leapfrog models of uh, seismic profiles 
throughout the Rutterfort uh, dome area. So this represents the granitic basement. And you can see that uh, when you get to the granites, there's this vertical uplift or nearly vertical uplift in the middle. And this corresponds very closely with what we see in terms of the numerical models of what happens after an impact event. Now, when we put onto this, uh, the layers that include the, the Vitz deposits, uh, the central rand group and whatnot, um, we see that these are also being upturned and uplifted as they approach the Gratterford Dome. So we have the structural uplift that's bringing these deposits up towards the surface and these, out, these uh, deposits do outcrop at the surface in the color rocks at Gratterford. But um, this has a significant impact on uh, not only the uh, the distribution of these deposits, but how they are preserved. So we have the uplift and upturning of these types of deposits, and there were um, probably a lot of syndepositional faults already within the Vitz deposits that the shockwave moving out from the, the Gretaport impact was able to reactivate many of those faults. The effect of this was that, uh, for one thing, the reactivation of faults and the brecciation of the Vitz conglomerates allowed for increased porosity within these conglomeratic layers, uh, but also the upturning of these rocks moved them from being in what was probably a closed uh, diagenetic system to bring them up to the surface so that even meteoric water could begin to infiltrate into these, uh, into these uh, Vitz conglomerate beds. So in the Vitz conglomerates, one thing that's been observed is that the hydrothermal processes are really preferentially affecting the Vitz conglomerate itself and not the surrounding um, crystalline rocks like the Pinterest lavas. And so we see that there's a real concentration of these uh, hydrothermal overprinting within the Vitz rocks themselves. Um, this is pretty consistent with uh, what we might be getting in this kind of post-impact hydrothermal system. So for one thing, the micas that have been dated in the Vitz deposits uh, pretty often yield a, a date that's indistinguishable from a Gretaport age, showing that there was a thermal overprinting at that time. Um, also, when there's been fluid inclusion studies uh, of uh, Vitz sediments, it seems like there, there's low pH uh, material, uh, low pH fluids that are affecting these deposits, which is more, which is not really consistent with a lot of igneous uh, sources of uh, fluids. And also uh, things like granitic enrichment of elements are not observed in any of the uh, bits conglomerate uh, hydrothermal overprint settings. So what we're really looking at is that something like a point source of heat from Bredeport combined with the structural upturning of the deposits is what was driving the preservation and alteration and maybe minor mobilization of gold within the Vitz deposits. Uh, one thing that's pretty remarkable is that numerical modeling of the post-impact temperatures predict that at a distance of about 100 kilometers from the center of the structure, you would wind up with temperatures that would be close to 300 degrees Celsius. Fluid inclusion studies of some of the Vitz gold deposits also have yielded a temperature of about 300, kilometer, uh, 300 degrees centigrade. So it seems like there is a coincidence between these types of predictions. Uh, so in short, the, the effect of the uh, hydrothermal system of Gretafort was coming down to four major factors. So there was meteoric water that changed the fluid chemistry. There was induced fracturing that increased the porosity and fluid flow. There was uplift, which changed the pressure conditions. And then there was a, uh, a geologically significant uh, heat source from Bredefort that gave you an elevated temperature conditions in these deposits. So I, to conclude my talk and move us to questions, um, there's a lot of different ways that impact events can be economically significant. Um, 
At Rutherford in particular, the main economic effect was the uplift in preservation and uh, to some extent hydrothermal overprinting of the Vitz gold deposits. Other things that may have formed, such as nickel copper PGE deposits, uh, may have formed, but now erosionally removed. Thank you. Matthew, thank you very much for that. That was a, a really enjoyable presentation. If anybody has any questions, please raise your hand. You can find the, the hand raising tool. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, go ahead. Um, in view that there have been um, a number of mines uh, on the periphery, gold mines, bits gold mines, on the periphery of the uh, Bradefort Dome, um, admittedly they, 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 they haven't, they've been redundant for, 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 for many decades, how was it possible, in view of the incredible, incredible impact that you are suggesting in the talk, that uh, some form of continuous mineralization was preserved that was mineable? Uh, um, so, in fact, we do, uh, some of the earliest exploration around uh, Rutherford was in uh, the hills and the collar rocks, you can go there now. I take my students there most years, not this year, uh, to see the exposure of the bit sediments within the, the collar of the Bredefort Dome. Um, so I think what you're asking, how can you have economically significant material there and all the way out to the locations of the mines, um, which is several hundred or a couple hundred kilometers away? Um, I think that that's really a question about the primary mineralization. And this is something that uh, Hartwig Fremel has been working on for a long time, talking about these giant fan deposits and types of uh, conglomerates that could have been forming in the Archean atmospheric conditions about 2.9 billion years ago. Um, so probably, um, let's see if that works. Uh, probably in the Archean Earth, um, the time when you start to deposit the Vitz sediments, uh, you have a couple of different sources of sediments from all around the Vitz Basin that are infilling the basin and, and loading the gold in. The, the effect of Redifort, um, it's hard to say to what extent it's really a coincidence that the Redifort structure happens to be in the exact center of this richest gold deposit in the entire planet. Um, if, the, if the impact had hit somewhere else, if it had hit uh, somewhere in Lesotho or Swaziland, would that be where the richest gold deposit is? Or was it really just the luckiest coincidence ever? Um, I, I don't really know the answer to that. Um, yes. Um, what, I, what I had in mind was um, a, a map I saw uh, many, uh, several um, decades ago that um, recorded the locations of um, the names of gold mines uh, in the Vitvartatran Basin and you've got those within the various established gold fields uh, from the Free State round to the round to Evander but there were several mines um, within a matter of a few kilometers from Vreda Fort itself, uh, yeah. around the impact structure. And clearly, if you're going to uh, have a, um, a, a mineable deposit, uh, it, it, you have to have some degree of con continuation within the mineralization. And from the, um, the, the, the visualization you gave, that, that, that incredible um, uh, initial um, impact uh, um, um, uh, representation you showed, which uh, I found most interesting, I, I, I can't understand how with that you would be able to have um, some degree of continuous mineralization that uh, would be mineable uh, um, within a matter of uh, a few kilometers from um, Breda Fort 
village. Yes. So um, when you have the impact happen, right? You can see on this diagram in this last panel, you have this upturn of the of the collar rocks, and that's going to be enough, which you can see on either the left or right side of the diagram. The upturn of the collar rocks is going to bring your buried sediment up to the surface. And that's what I was showing with those um, with those nice leapfrog diagrams of my Mercholin Moretzi, where you have really this vertical uplifting of the sediments, and that brings them up. But then after the impact, after that video that I showed you, that basically shows you 10 minutes in that simulation. Uh, but for thousands of years after that, you have faults that are uh, breaking down and repeating strata. So there's a lot of uh, repetition of stratigraphy as you're moving uh, radially out from the Gretaport structure. And uh, you can even see that in, in some extent with the exact locations of the mines because um, you have a lot of them in the collar where there, there's, it's littered with adits where uh, a lot of the guys in the early or the late 1800s were um, trying to find something there. Um, but then the next mines are a bit of a way out from the collar. And so that's this, um, this weird structural deformation that's going on in the post-impact environment. Okay, thank you. Tanya? Tanya? Can, can you Here hear we me? go. Yes, Jules, sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Please go ahead. Oh. Oh, thank you, Tanya. Thanks for a nice talk, Matthew. Um, uh, just a couple of things. Uh, one, um, with regards to the um, Sudbury structure, uh, I don't think uh, I recall seeing an age for the structure that uh, that you mentioned in your slides or, or in your talk, yeah. And the other thing is that uh, hanging on to that, um, uh, are you aware of all the uh, work that has been done uh, by um, Professor Wolfgang Elston um, from I think New Mexico uh, to try to show that the Bushveld complex might have been a result of uh, multiple uh, impacts um, as well uh, that triggered the bushveld itself. So uh, your comments would be welcome. Thank yes. you. So, um, so it's actually two questions about ages, in fact. Um, so the Sudbury impact structure is 1,850 million years old. Um, it's a little bit younger than Rutherford at 2020, so 150 million or 170 million years difference. Now, Rutherford is, uh, the actual date that's been obtained is 2019 plus or minus two. Uh, from some crystalline rocks that are in the middle of the impact structure that do not have shock effects. So these are things that in these elevated temperatures after the impact crystallized and it is zircons from those rocks that give that very precise age. Now Bushveld, um, I think there's a lot of people listening to me right now that can say a lot more about Bushveld than I can, but the generally accepted age on Bushveld is 2060 million years. So it's 40 million years older just by age dating, but we don't even need the complicated types of analysis like that because we find offshoots of the Bushveld complex within Bredefort that are shock metamorphosed. And so Bushveld had to be before Bredefort. Um, and there's really no question about that. Now, in terms of if there was a different impact that happened 40 million years earlier that was producing Bushveld, um, there's just, uh, there's actually a lot of uh, guys that have tried to do numerical simulations of that. And it's not, it, to put it very simply, it's not physically possible for an impact to produce that particular feature. Thank you. Do we have um, uh, James, please? Yeah, hi. Uh, is my speaker working? Yes, it is. Go ahead. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Matthew, great talk. Thanks. Really enjoyed that. Um, from an economic uh, perspective, one thing that I've been following with interest is the helium uh, discovery that's uh, being developed by Renogen uh, that is somehow related apparently to the 
three to four impacts, be that the radiogenic decay of basement and or the the faulting that you show quite nicely in one of uh, one of the last slides uh, slides there as being the conduits that are allowing this deep seated gas to get to surface. Um, yeah, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that. Um, it's it's interesting. It's not something that I've really looked at in very much detail, so I don't think I can say anything substantial about that. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. They, are there any other questions? James, do you have another question or is your hand just up from the last time? Uh, no, not the time. Okay. Anybody else? Going once, going twice, sold. Matthew, thank you so much once again for a very interesting presentation. I'm just really sorry that there aren't more or bigger diamonds associated with the, the Fred of Fort Dome. Once again, thank you very much to um, Terracord Geospectral Imaging for our sponsorship for the July series of lunchtime lectures. Thank you all and I hope to see you again next week. Uh, so, Lisa, if you can close the meeting, that would be great, please.